Hey, hey, hey. We are Hello. live. We are live. Hello, Facebook. Hello, Mosaic. Hello, visitors. <clears throat> hello, uh, I don't know. Hello, hello. Is that what you were saying? Hello, hello. Good evening, everybody. I didn't realize how out of the center I was. You're not doing that song in the center, are you? Or at the no, center? Yeah, no. In the center, that's, uh, that'd be like, yeah. I don't know how we do that. We did at the center last week, but uh, a lot of people have asked if this is pre recorded because uh, my window is dark. And, uh -huh. uh, but I'm in a basement, so this is a, one of those weird windows where I'm actually underground and the earth stops up there. But it lets a little light in during the day. Anyways, uh, yeah, tonight we're going to talk about what it means to uh, trust God and what it looks like in different seasons of life. And sort of tackling that maybe from a different angle than maybe what you would expect and talking about the goodness of God and uh, I think some of the attributes of God that we're uh, familiar with are easy to uh, affirm like yes God is powerful and God is all-knowing and God is uh, omniscient and omnipresent but sometimes it's hard to really in our soul feel good about saying that he is good so we're going to uh delve into that and i think it'll be actually very refreshing for people and maybe not what you think it would be um so i'm excited and i can tell by look on tony's face he, he's just amped look how amped Tony is. <laughs> I'm, I'm wearing my yankee hat hoping for baseball one of these days um no offense to you, Indian fans. You're a Yankees fan? I grew up in New York. Yeah, but... What a way to be. You don't remind me of, like, that New York. You remind me of, like, Buffalo Bills, New York. Well, that's... That's, like, you know, that's a but, different New York. Uh, you know, the rest of New York pretty much adopts the Yankees. There are a couple Mets fans, maybe occasional Pirate fan or an Indian fan, but most everybody is a Yankee fan. So, well, they have a cool so, logo. Yep, and I liked the Yankees way before they were good. So when I was a kid, the, well, they're good. When I was getting into baseball. They were not a good baseball team. Took a lot of years for them to get to, to where they were. Yeah. So, what are sports going to look like this year? It's going to be weird. I haven't the slightest idea. I, I do believe that uh, you know if if everything goes in the manner which. Um, I believe it will because the Bills have a really good football team mm -hmm. is there will be no football. So that is, you know, so if oh, I the irony, it, the irony yes. will be because they're good, there will be no football. That's right. I'm trying to get my head to be as big as your head on the thing. I think that's about that's it. Not an easy, that's not an easy that's task. I've got a pretty good sized melon. We're going to go back as far as we can so you kind of look like Gandalf and I look like a hobbit. Because <laughs> normally I'm the guy with the huge noggin. Nice. All right. I'm going to sing this song and then we're going to get to it, okay? I got my wife helping me here at the lyrics. And, oh, you know what? Hold on one second. Tony, what, what sports season are we in right now? I'm obviously not. Well, <laughs> well it's supposed to be, uh, at this point, basically just baseball and then looking forward to um, looking forward to football camp beginning. But uh, not exactly sure what that's going to look like. We should also be in the NBA and the NHL playoffs heading toward their championship series through the Stanley Cup and the NBA championship. So, uh, but nobody really knows right now. No, no, not so far. Wow. All right. 
Here we go. This song's called uh, Trust. Story behind this, um, this was one of those songs that actually came about in my life right before a really uh, devastating time in my life. Um, not too long ago, actually. I won't get into all that, but um, this is one of those songs that... Um, it's like you ever read a book and you're like, yeah, it doesn't really apply to me. And then a year later, you're like, oh, I read that book because uh, now it's applying. This is one of those songs that um, I felt like, yeah, this kind of applies to me. But I actually had to kind of live it out in some ways that I wasn't expecting. And um, I'm very grateful and thankful for that. Um, but sometimes walking through that is not the most fun. So this song is called Trust. And we didn't have audio on there. Here we go. You are a father to the orphan. You are a provider to the poor. To the broken, you're all I need and more. You are the water in the desert, you are my shelter in the storm, you are the sunlight in the shadow. Let your name be glorified Let your name 
trust you with my life Through the lows, through the highs I will trust you with my life So let your name be glorified So we're talking about trust and trusting God. And Matt, uh, there was a specific direction you wanted to go this evening. Do you want to kind of lead into that? Yeah, I do. Um... And by the way, I want to invite everybody, please ask questions, make comments. Um, we want this to be as interactive as possible. We'll do our best to pay attention to what's going on online, too. So. Yeah, we are. Here. This is to do this together. Go ahead, Matt. I'm sorry. I'm just going to pull up the feed on here so I can keep an eye on it. You got a lot of screens going. But so here's the deal. Uh, you told me earlier a story about a person that you had talked to. And the person was struggling with. How can I put this? But being. They're struggling with how to spend their time and feeling guilty that if they weren't spending their time doing something, I would say spiritual, that maybe mm. God would be mad at them or they weren't living a pleasing life to the Lord, um, all that. And uh, i try to get this set up here so I can actually see these comments. Um, and I started thinking, I wonder what happens in people's hearts and minds when we for one i'll just start on my end my world singing songs what happens when we sing a song like i surrender all or we sing a song like white flag or we sing a song like this trust and we say i'm going to trust you with my whole entire life through the lows and through the highs i'm trusting you with my whole entire life and i thought i wonder if that actually kind of hits us in the sort of spiritual solar plexus and knocks the wind out of us a bit if we don't if we don't see that correctly and um yeah, i don't know how private that story was so i won't get too much detail but this person was struggling with the idea of doing something that was very fun to them brought them a lot of joy um and it wasn't it wasn't something sinful it wasn't something immoral it was just something that wasn't spiritual it wasn't bible reading it wasn't right prayer and so I, I said to Tony, you know, if we don't teach this stuff right, singing songs like this could be a disservice. And, and if we don't teach this right and we don't explain through these things right and we don't work or walk with folks through these principles, it could actually really be damaging if a person perceives surrendering all, meaning if you're not on your hands and knees praying 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and reading the Bible and doing what we consider spiritual things, then you're not a good Christian. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's really fascinating to know what it means to be, you know, like I wanted to interweave tonight. What does it mean to surrender our lives to God? And let's, let's interweave also what that means to be made in his image, to be a child of God, to be pleasing in his sight. Um, certainly because of the blood of Jesus, but also in a very mysterious way in our actions that that he would take delight to see us. Um, you know, it's like that. What was the that old movie where the guy says, when I run, I feel God smiling. Was yeah. it Ch Chariots yeah. of Glory Chariots or of player. Chariots of Fire? Chariots of Fire, yeah. Um, yeah, and so I always thought, man, uh, how do we, because I've struggled with this. How do I say I surrender all? And then I'm like, well, but I might go home and watch Netflix with my wife. I might uh, go out to eat and just spend time talking about hunting or something. I mean, what does it mean to make something holy? What does it mean to make something 
too spiritual. Um, and we'll get into that because that could sound weird to some people. But I wanted to talk about what it means to live a life that's surrendered to God, recognizing that we can give everything to him because he's good. Um, but it doesn't always look like what we think it looks like. So that's where I want to go. Well, I, I think it comes with the first thing we need to understand is what the word good means. You know, if we go to let, let's, uh, if, you know, if I'm going to go back to Genesis chapter one for a minute. Of course, this is a dangerous move in the sense that um, we all have heard the creation story. Um, but what I, I think sometimes what I don't think we get is um, what God said was good. You know, when he says good, um, what does he mean by good? When, when, when what he made was good, it was a reflection of his goodness. You know, uh, the idea that God is good, um, what he does is good, uh, and he takes pleasure. And I think that's, I think that's a, a misnomer for all of us. Is we sometimes we don't realize that God takes pleasure in us. So I'm going to begin here in Genesis one. It says, "In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and now the earth was formless and empty." I'm waiting patience. for it to uh, change over here, if, if it does. It's still doing it? Live it is, but there's... Okay, so there's something wrong with that feed. <laughs> so let me take this off. Sorry about that, everybody. I saw people panicking online. I thought, okay. Someone said it sounded like a tornado. Let me go back... Well, we are supposed to get some weather tonight. Maybe we got it early. Whenever you're ready. <laughs> it's, ple it's pleasant. So it's pleasant to the ears and the eyes, right? Okay, so what we want to look at here is this, and, and we need to redefine good. You know, when we think of being God being good, we think of that which he does for us that is, um, that is a core, that, that what is a, what appeals to us. Well, really what is pleasant to us. And, um, but I think a lot of times we don't realize that God is a God of pleasure, that God takes pleasure. So if we go on and, and to, um, if we go on to verse Yes. Oh, okay. So where were we? Genesis. <laughs> okay. All right. So. It, yeah, go ahead and start in Genesis one, because I think that the whole scripture was, was blocked out there. So go okay. ahead and, and, well, and work that. 
Okay, so what we're doing is we're looking at God being good and the goodness of God. And what God does is being being an expression of his goodness. So that all that he did is good because he is good. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And now the, the earth was formless and empty. It was void. It was darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And I said, God, so God said in verse three, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. It was pleasant. It was something that was uh, agreeable and very excellent. And he, we go through all of creation and he speaks of those things, of this being pleasant, agreeable, and excellent. These being an expression of his very nature, his goodness. And so what I want us to see is two things, is that God is good and the expression of his character is good, so that what he makes is good. And what that is in his sight is pleasurable, excellent, uh, appealing. Uh, it's agreeable. It sits well. And then if we go to Genesis 2, there's a moment when he actually says something isn't good. So if we go down to verse 15, it says he took the, he, the, God took the man who he made that was very good, very excellent. In other words, he saw what he had made in his image, mankind. He formed it from the dust. He breathed life into it. He stepped back on day six, looked at all that he had done. He said, this is very good. This is very excellent. So now we're in chapter two. We're going to look at verse 15. So now, you know, this is a little more detailed uh, uh, description of creation. In verse 15, he says, the Lord took the man and he put him in the garden, which was good to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but don't eat from the tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because when you eat from it, well, you'll certainly die. Then God said, it is not good for man to be alone. It is not good. So I'm going to stop there for a minute. So one of the things we want to ask ourselves is now when we go into the, to the Hebrew, this is the same word. So now this is not pleasant. It's not agreeable. It's not excellent. So one of the things we might want to ask ourselves is, did God make a mistake? Did, is this contradictory? Is man the way he made man not good? No, he made man well. It is good. It was pleasant to him. It was agreeable to him. He saw it as being very excellent. But in regard to the condition that he that that man has been found in, he sees that this is not good. Now, to, again, does that mean that God did something wrong? No, God is unfolding this in front of us. This is a story that he's unfolding. He's unfolding himself. The expression of who we remember, this is really the written introduction of God to mankind. This is Genesis. This is the beginning. This is God revealing himself as good. And he's expressing it in a tangible way by saying, what I have made is good. And now what I want you to see is I have made this to be good. This is all excellent, but it's not yet complete. It's not finished. I want you to see this unfold as my goodness increases and becomes deeper and richer and more profound. So it was excellent that he made man the way he made man. But what he was saying to, he's not saying that it's not good that man's alone because, oh my goodness, I'm surprised I made a mistake. What he's saying is I'm unfolding this in front of you and I'm showing you my goodness. And now I want to see you, the, I want you to see the increasing of my goodness. I want you to see that when I see you for who you are and the excellence with which I've made you and the relationship that I have with you, I'm going to reveal something even more good, more excellent. I'm going to unfold this further for you. So the Lord God said, it is not good for me. It's not excellent for the man to be alone. I will do what? I'll make a suitable helper for him. I will increase my good. I will expand my good. I will multiply my good. I will deepen my good. I will make more profound my good. I, he continues to unfold his goodness. And what he's unfolding here now, first he unfolds the, the goodness of it, just the nature of who he is and being the maker and creator of all things, the lover of all things, and, the, and he takes care of all things. But now he's revealing more of his goodness by saying, now I have something even more excellent for you. As you now are introduced to that which is good and my character which is good and my nature which is good and what I've made is good, I'm going to show you even more goodness. As good as this is, let me give you more. 
And this is where we need to recognize how God makes, how God exists in his own person and that he is so good and he is so loving and he so desperately wants to, to just continue to express his goodness to us, to unfold it in front of us as a perpetual discovery. Let me say that again. This is a perpetual discovery of God, his character, his nature, his goodness. He says, now watch this. You see, if we were to go back to Genesis 1, which we won't, I'll describe it, but you can go back and read it. You'll see that there are a number of times he, he, he as he's creating, he says, God, singular. And he makes something. He speaks it into existence. He, he, he does what he does. Then when he goes to make mankind, he says, let us now, let us, we, plural, make God, let make man in our image. When he does that, he is, he's unfolding himself in front of us. He was singular, although we see the spirit. He, he God described himself as singular using a singular personal pronoun um, all the way through creation until he gets to mankind. And then all of a sudden he reveals something new about himself. Because when it said the spirit is hovering over the water, it doesn't say this, it doesn't say God, the Holy Spirit. He just says the spirit. But now he's unfolding something in front of us and he's saying, now watch this. There's more to me than what you think. I'm not merely this, this kind of godly wizard who puts who makes things out of nothing. I'm very personal. So I'm going to make you perfect. Go ahead. I was going to say, uh, question, mm -hmm. Can, is it possible to trust God if you do not believe in his goodness? <sighs> I think it would be, I think it's very difficult to trust God if you don't believe in his goodness. Like think about any other friendship, any other relationship. You have a working relationship with somebody and the degree you see their goodness is the degree you're going to trust them. I would and say the, my own personal life, mm -hmm. uh, the more I see of his goodness, the more my heart has been enabled to trust that it's kind of, it's working its way out together. So it's, 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 uh, does that make sense at all? That I have trusted him, but only to a certain degree. And I'm growing in that trust of him, um, as, as I'm capable, but that capability I think is only widened by me experiencing, seeing, and believing in his goodness, because I think that's the key. I, I see people believe that God's powerful, but still don't trust him. I think well, the devil and, believes God's powerful, you mm -hmm. know, but doesn't trust. I guess, well, would he believe he's good? No, he would not believe he's good. Well, he would certainly not agree what was about of what, what is good. good. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing about the creation story. We think it's about creation. We think it's about what he's made. It isn't. It's him expressing his person by his goodness. And so what we need to recognize is everything that he has made is good. The reason it's important that we now go to him expressing himself as a community, plural, we, us, is because what he's saying is, this is what he's doing. He's saying, everything that I have done is good. It's pleasant. It's agreeable. It's excellent. Now there's this moment in time where I'm going to unveil something to you and I'm going to show you that which is good, but the condition is not complete. Now I'm going to really express my goodness. I'm going to express it because this is how good I am. I am more than one. I'm the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I am good to myself and we are good to one another. And it is best to exist in such a way. And he's saying to man, he's saying, listen, we are going to make you. And it's not good. I'm not alone. I have the Father, mm -hmm. the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm not leaving you alone. And so that, that he's now he's expressing his goodness in terms of not just that he has made us and that he abides with us, but now he cares for us and he cares for our condition. He did not leave us alone. And that that speaks volumes. So the human being needs connection. You know, right now we're all struggling because we we feel alone. We all desire connection with the body. We all desire to, to interact. Well, wh where's, that, where's that come from? Well, this is an earthly expression of this kingdom truth, that God's goodness is expressed in connecting, mm. connecting with himself to us and connecting us together. 
And so what we're finding out is that God is good. He, what he's made is good. Then he unfolds that goodness to a greater extent by connecting us with one another. And then what we're finding out right now is we desperately need what is good. We're finding out connection is good and we're missing out on it. And this is the expression of God's goodness. Um, go ahead. You, uh, but, it, but I think you're right. I don't know that we can trust anyone if we don't know they're good. You know, um, if we doubt their goodness. Yeah. I, you know, the Aslan, uh, people quote the Aslan character, um, a lot. The, um, that, that, that quote, uh, says that he's good, but he's not safe. Something like that. I'm not mm -hmm. safe, but I am good. Um, I know some of you guys out there probably know I'm butchering that quote from Narnia Chronicles, but um, I think that's a wonderful picture of God. But I think sometimes we let there's a certain psychology that goes there, and we're I think we get mixed up a little bit. That certainly God is a warrior. A God is is awesome and mighty and powerful. But I think that we can comfortably say as a follower of Jesus, that God is a safe place. He mm -hmm. is a safe place. He, he himself has attributes that I don't understand and are wild. And in that way, it's not safe in that way, but he is safe in his goodness. He is, he is a refuge. The Psalms speak of him being a refuge, I mean, countless times. So I think that's something we need to remember too, that God is a safe place for us to hide. God is a safe place for us to abide in. Um, and that's part of his goodness. Well, and the irony is, when if if we were to go further in the creation story, when did man and man, when did the man and woman find themselves in trouble? When they took them out, took themselves out from under God's wing. Right. When they walked away from Him and got alone, right. that they were safe. Even Jesus said when He prayed for the disciples, He said, "I have protected them by the name You have given Me. I've been present right. with them, and I have protected them. Now, Father, protect them with Your Spirit. Yeah. Protect them by Your truth." Yeah, no, he is a very safe place, a refuge in a, in a time of trouble. Absolutely, absolutely. But again, we learn to trust that. Yeah, We learn to trust that. Were there any questions or anything? That... Let me check this out here. We've got a bunch of stuff coming reason, in. I, yeah, I don't have a whole lot of... I, I'm having technical difficulties on my end, too. A lot of folks here are uh, drilling in on the relationship aspect. Brad is saying... Um, if it wasn't good for man to be alone, isn't, isn't it then about relationship? And Andrew Rick said, it's all about relationship. Um, Ducia says, the more I know the character of God through scripture, the easier and the more I trust him. Mm -hmm. Um, which is, that's a neat correlation that the more we know, the more our heart, you know, like we get, we have this, uh, knowledge this information about the goodness of god but if it just mm -hmm. stops there it's dead it's dead religion right. but if it becomes informative to our relationship then our heart begins to beat with the information and it helps it helps our heart and and let's let's go back to that word pleasant right when god said it's good that it's pleasant that it's agreeable he was taking pleasure in what he has made and he took pleasure in the way he made it and he found even greater pleasure when he expanded what that what that making was and, and that goes to back to the story we started out with this evening. You know, an indiv individual has a great desire and a great pleasure in, in a physical activity that is good and wholesome. But they called, they, you know, they contacted me and said, man, I'm just suffering because every time I do this, I feel guilty. And I come back to God and ask his forgiveness that I'm not praying. And one of my points was, to some degree, that is praying. When, when God has made us in a certain way and he delights in our making, and we are rejoicing and finding delight in how we've been made. She began to loathe how she was made and not like that she liked what she liked to do because she thought it was there was something wrong with having done it. That's a shame. Our God takes pleasure in, who, in how he's made us. Mm -hmm. And now he's created us in Christ Jesus to redeem those things. But he, he finds great delight in his creation. And, he, and it's agreeable to him. And he finds pleasure in it. And that's why we need to understand that when he said it was good, he was saying, I'm taking pleasure in this. I'm taking pleasure in you. And I'm taking pleasure in what I'm laying out for you. And it is about relationships. And I when like, we... Go ahead. Sorry. I was going to no, say, please. 
I, I really like uh, Andrew Ricks. He said, trust seems naturally expectant upon goodness. Mm. And I think that's neat. I mean, I think the nature of trust is, is like that part of us opens up because it's expecting goodness. If you don't expect goodness, you don't open up that p- part of your heart. In fact, we have to see goodness before we can open our heart to it. Right. You know, you know, if now it, there, there may be somebody who appears neutral, but what do we do then? We test them. Mm-hmm. We test them to see if they're good. W- will I get a pleasurable response from them? Will I get an agreeable response from them? Yeah. You know, I, I knew a young man one time who s- suffered terribly with social anxiety and to the degree where he would he would hide. He would just hide himself as long as we were in a place where there was a group. And as I began to watch him mature and try to reach out to test, to test people to see whether or not they were safe, what he would do is he, he wouldn't say anything. He would sneak up behind somebody and he'd put his finger on there, just put it on their arm, just like this. And he would just stand there. And depending on how that person responded to him, would tell him whether or not that, that person was safe and trustworthy. I if know it was that a, person <laughs> because that person did that to me. <laughs> it's crazy. And I, I remember watching and him and we test people just like that. If it's a neutral person, that's listen, if it's a bad person, we know to run. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to interact with that person because they're bad. If they're a good person, we're drawn to them and we want to go to them because we trust them and we know we're going to get a pleasant or agreeable or an excellent response. It's the neutral person that we struggle with because we don't know how to take them. And so we have to test them. Right. Well, to some degree, we see that everything that made everything that God has made is excellent oh, and it's wonderful. Go ahead. Maybe go. It, it, isn't that isn't that perfect parallel? If we talk about the dynamic of relationship, isn't that exactly the world and God and us and God? There are those who see him as cruel and they don't. Yeah. So they don't even get near. There's those that uh, whose hearts have been. Uh, enlivened and given life and redeemed by him and trust with their whole hearts and lives. And then there are those who are just in the neutral zone. Yeah. And I think we all struggle at times of being in the neutral zone with God. But I think as we build upon, like you said, the relate, because the neutral, what do you have to do? You have to test the water. Yes. And, and that's okay. Now, you know, it's funny. There's a verse that when Jesus is being tempted and Satan says, Throw yourself off this place because it says that the angels will keep you from stubbing your toe, right? And what did Jesus, Jesus turns around and says to Satan, quotes it and says, do not put the Lord God, the Lord your God to the test. And we go, oh, okay. And so we're paralyzed for a moment. But the psalmist says we're to approach that principle a little differently. He said, what I want you to do is taste and see. It's like being handed, a, you know, any new attribute of God is like being given a plate full of food you've never had before. And the cook is eager for you to taste it because he knows it's good. He knows what the ingredients are. He knows how he seasoned it. He knows how, he knows the nutritional value here. But when we are handed the plate, what do we do? We kind of we kind of draw back and our nostrils flare a little bit, and we wonder: is this is this any good? Mm-hmm. What is the cook saying? What's the chef saying to you? Taste it. Taste it. Taste it. Yeah. Trust it. Trust me. You're going to see that it's what. That it's good. And so what the psalmist is saying is, listen, God knows our nature that when we are when we're unsure, when we're not quite sure if this is good or bad, mm-hmm. whether this is going to be pleasant or unpleasant, that we're going to we're going to be we're, we're just going to kind of circle the, the table and kind of look to see what's there. And then so God, knowing our nature, he's not offended by that. I tell people all the time, God knows we don't trust him. He knows yeah. we can't trust him until we've learned to trust him. Until we and taste so the and see. Taste and see. Taste, taste, taste it and see. And then all of a sudden when we find that he's good, what do we do? We gobble the plate up. Until what? The next time he brings a new meal, a new circumstance, something we haven't experienced before. Yeah. And he's saying, okay, it's okay. I'm the, I'm the great chef. Here's a new plate. Taste and see. Now, I wanna... And if we're willing to, go ahead, please. Oh. I want to touch on, Ducia said something, and I want to touch on it and then speak to it. She said, we as humans need to earn each other's trust because we are broken pieces. God, on the other hand, deserves our trust because he is sinless and perfect. I agree, but yes. I under the umbrella of because our framework 
is with broken pieces, we yeah. will naturally see God as a broken piece until we taste and see. So the inform if if I just have the knowledge that God deserves my trust, that is not enough for me to get there in my heart. I right. must experience that. So I agree with you on that comment, Ducia, but I I think as long as we clarify that there's an experiential element to the knowing, yes, God does yeah. deserve our trust. But yes. but and that that alone that statement alone in my mind can't yeah. get to my heart until I taste it. Well, and that's just it. You know, the, the the one of the ways to look at that is to understand this. Just because I don't trust someone doesn't make them not trustworthy. In other right. words, that's that doesn't call the question their character. My inability to trust God doesn't mean I don't think God can be trusted. It means my heart is not in a place to be able to trust him in this area. It, I'm human. I'm broken. You know, she said it beautifully. We're broken pieces. Mm -hmm. He knows we're broken pieces. He knows what our nature is and that we're fearful. We're afraid. And so he coaxes us toward him. Yeah. It's, 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 you know, he gives us morsels of himself. That's what, listen, when we go back to Genesis, we're not going to read it again, but when you go back to Genesis and you watch the creation story unfold in front of you through those first two chapters, what God is doing is he's enticing the Jews, the Israelites at the time who were receiving this, he's enticing them into a relationship with a good God. Because think about who he was talking to. He was talking to a generation of people who, who served nothing but idols and fickle gods and gods that were menacing and ugly. And, and he's saying, no, all those other gods that you see all the nations worshiping, first of all, they're not gods. Second of all, they're rotten. They're evil. Mm. They're not kind. They're not good. They could care less about human beings. In fact, when you put your trust there, you're in peril. I'm going to unveil myself in front of you in a way that is going to build trust in me i'm yeah. gonna show you my goodness one step at a time uh, we oh man we get this i get this we get this we uh, god is so gracious in this mm. process yes i think oh uh, our image of god you know it's funny we're, you're you went to genesis the, the idea we're created in God's image. How often do we create God in our image? We do. We flip mm, that, right? Which is yeah. really an idol. You know, it's not the true. It, it, it doesn't. Need, it doesn't have to be an enjoyable thing to be an idol either. We could have created this idolized version of God, who's a monster, and we can't. Mm -hmm. We're addicted to that monster version, and we're stuck. And so I, think, I want to go. Oh, go ahead. Keep going. It's just. I want to go. He's so gracious. That's, that's that's all I want to say is he knows he's not he's not going. Ah, I wonder if they're having a hard time trusting me. <laughs> he is right. gracious. He knows yeah. there could be a there's father issues. He knows there's mother issues. He knows there's relational issues. He knows about abuse. He knows he knows our stories, and he's gracious, intimately. So I want to go back to something. To see what what, what Desia asked was, um. Oh, because what she, she said is she true. just made a, a comment, which I right. agree with. I agree. with. And, she, and she's right. Yeah, and she's right. Because, you know, when she talks about us being broken pieces, to one of those idols, when we make God out to be what we are, I'm broken. He must be broken. Or I'm I, you yeah. know, you know, we we are seeing through a filter that is smudged and cracked and dirty and and chipped and sometimes even the wrong lens. Right. Right. The, the, and you said it, the amazing thing about God's mercy and his, his mercy is he doesn't crush us for not trusting him, right? His grace is that he gives us opportunity, the gift of time and the building of faith and, and you know, just the, the opportunity yeah. to grow and trust in him. Yeah, it's like his mercy is the withholding of punishment, mm -hmm. you know, it's lifting us out of hell. His grace is then giving us things beyond our wildest imagination and dream, thinking, wow, it was good enough you just saved me from hell, but now now you're going to love me and walk with me and welcome me into your 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 presence. And, and uh, I mean, yeah, that's a beautiful way to look at it. So, so it's, you know, I, I love the point very much. And I think, uh, you know, I think that, um, um, I think the key we have to remember is he remembers our, as much as yes, yes, God is trustworthy and he presents himself as such. And when we learn, when we walk with him, we, we learn that and we grow in that. The, what's amazing about him is he recognizes, he recognizes our humanity and doesn't, doesn't ask us to go beyond our, our 
ability and capacity. He yes. meets us where we are and he coaxes us to him. Yeah. And there, yes, his mercies are new every morning. And that's what so he's just unveiling himself day after day after day. That's why it's such a neat thing to have time with him, because yeah. this is where we build the trust. This is where yeah. we see him, what he says about himself. He meets us by his spirit in his truth. He speaks to our souls and brings us peace. And he begins to coax us into deeper into a relationship with him. Yeah, you know, and to go back to thinking about what I my original thought with even songs and what those do to us and how they can even damage us when they're not mm -hmm. meant to, the you know, the. The global church has received a lot of flack for singing songs that may be unrealistic or too much promise made to God or too much, you know, there's been all kinds of flack there and that. And, and I look at a song like an old great hymn, like, uh, I surrender all and, uh, or maybe that's considered a chorus. I don't know, but. A song like that, I, I look at a song like that and I go, listen, God knows my capacity for surrender right now. In my heart, I'm surrendering all that I'm c capable of. I certainly can't. I, for me to surrender all, all would mean I'd have to know the depth, the, the full depth of my depravity. <laughs> and to know that would probably just melt my being into a pillar of salt or something. I don't know what would happen to me. But in that moment, I, I can focus on, and this is just my encouragement to the congregation. When we're singing stuff like that, I don't want it to be disingenuous. Um, I want it to be real, and I want it to be authentic, and I don't want you to shy away from it either. Now, if there's something in our lives that we know God is specifically challenging us on to, um, like a behavior or an attitude or something like that that we know is sinful and wrong and it's, it's not pleasing, to God or to others, then that's something we need to lay down and we can surrender that. Um, but to, to say it's impossible to, you know, sing things like that. I just think it's a way that we're almost preaching to ourselves. We're reinforcing the truth in ourselves. We're exercising this muscle of surrender. You don't just surrender all to God once in a church service and walk away and go, I surrendered all. We don't have to ever have that on the set list anymore. It's a continual daily, hourly, minute by minute thing, and it's a muscle that we exercise. So I am a pro surrender all as much as you can every day. Come to Jesus and surrender, and he'll give you the grace. And sometimes it might be disingenuous, but he's going to smile. He's going to pick you up and brush you off, and then the next time maybe there's more more genuineness in it. We're just we're we're doing the He's giving us grace, and he's gracious, and, and he understands that there are times that we sing and, and or we read a book and we make statements, and, and maybe it's not wholeheartedly true. Um, but I, I just have a radar on those extreme-type statements and songs, and I think people sometimes get a little freaked out by that. Mm -hmm. And I think, hey, just go for it. He's a God of mercy, a God of grace, and he wants to, he wants as much of your heart as you in that moment can give. I hope that isn't heresy, and I hope you get what I'm saying. Uh, and it's not heresy, and it's exactly what God is saying. You know, he, uh, he knows our nature to the degree that he actually only reveals enough of, as much of himself to us that our faith can handle. Right. And he only shows us enough of us that our faith can handle. And as we grow in capacity, he blesses with growth and capacity. Uh, you know, if we were to go to Matthew 25, and I, and I know we don't have a whole lot of time here, left, but I want to go to Matthew 25 for a minute. And, and this, this actually stems from a, um, uh, you know, going here is, is kind of stemming from a, a sermon series I did a couple of years ago, probably, um, in, in regard to how well God knows us. And takes pleasure in us. So in, in Genesis, we see that God takes pleasure in us, in, in, in having made us and, and having breathed life into us and having relationship with us and giving us, unfolding that in front of us and giving us even more relationship that not only do we are we made in the image of God, but now we're also in the likeness of God in this beautiful communal relationship. We also know that sin broke that up a little bit. Right. Sin separated us from God. Sin caused us to go our own way. In fact, our going our own way was sin. What was the great sin of the garden that Adam and Eve chose to go their way? 
God said, come my way. Eat from the tree of life. You'll live forever. Go your own way. You're, you're, that's troublesome. Well, God still loved us so much that he sent his son back to us to say, no, I want you. I made you with great pleasure. I, 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 I love you with all my heart. Let's bring this, let's bring this home. Let's bring this back. And what I want us to see here is this, in the context of, of uh, him, how well he knows us. And then he knows us each. This is, we're going to be in Matthew 25. We're going to start at verse 14. And, and it, it, listen, it, it's not just that God knows us. He knows me. And he knows Matt. And it's not that he just knows me and Matt or Mark or Teresa or Elizabeth or Fritzy, you know. He knows everything about us. And I think sometimes when we read a story like this, we don't recognize ex really what Jesus is saying here. So it's verse 14, it says, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. In other words, knowing his servants, he took what was his and he gave it to them, entrusting them. Verse 15, to one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags of gold, and to another one bag of gold. And we go, okay, well, that I don't know if that's fair. I'm not sure how to, exactly to see that. Well, look what it says next. He, it says, each according to his ability. And we think, okay, well, according to their skills. No, it's not just their skills. It's also their character. It's their nature. It's the type of relationship he had with them. It's having, having watched them live life and do work and walk. In other words, he brought these servants to himself. And according to their ability, as he had watched and observed and assessed and related to, he entrusted aspects of his wealth or kingdom to them. This is what, and, and each one of them responded almost identically as the master had viewed them and seen them. The five bag man went off and invested and got five more. The two bag man went and invested and got two more. The one bag man buried it in the ground. It's like every one of them actually then responded exactly the way the master had thought they would respond. That's how intimately our father knows us. He takes pleasure in us and he gives us every opportunity to walk with him according to his knowledge of how he has made me. And he takes pleasure in that. Look what it goes on to say. So we go down to verse 21, or at verse 19, it says, And after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. And the man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five and said, Master, you entrusted me with five bags, and I've gained five more. Watch, watch his response to this. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful, good, pleasurable, agreeable. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. You know what's really interesting about this? Going back to the young lady who called me and was just grieving because she was afraid she was disappointing God. You know what God didn't do to any of these men? Tell them how to do the job. At no point do you see God, the master, saying to the person, now this is what I want you to do. I want you to do exactly this way. If you don't do it this way, you're not doing it right. No, he knew their abilities. He knew these people. And he gave them, gave, gave them the gifts or the things, the talents to them according to their ability. It said, now go do. And it's recorded a little differently in another place where it says one invested, one put it in the bank, and one buried it in the ground. He didn't tell them how to do it. He didn't tell them. No, he, he knew, knew who they were, invested in them, and said, now go do your thing. I know you. I know your ability. I know your capacity. I know your gifts. I know your strengths. I know your integrity. I know your character. I know you. Go. Go do it. And he does that with us even today. Even today. He knows my name. He knows who I am. He knows the gifts he's given me, the talents, the strengths, the skills. He knows what I've come through. He knows, he knows how he's making me. And he doesn't give me anything that isn't according to what he knows my ability is, my capacity is, my gifts are, my strengths are, what appeals to me. Think about the number of worship leaders and pastors out there and teachers and how differently we each express ourselves 
in the context of where he has us. Isn't it beautiful that the, the 150 Psalms don't have a single tune written to them? But he gives Matt Howe permission to write these beautiful, you know, these beautiful gifts to his brothers and sisters as Matt Howe is, is designed and able and what appeals to him. I just think it's incredible. Is this making sense? Yeah. Was this where we were going? <laughs> Is this helpful? I think so. Yeah, I was. I was still. I'm. I'm like in the one bag, two bag, five man zone. I'm like, I've heard this story before, but I'm still like, I need closure. But it does get a little. It it does get a little depressing. It gets sad. <laughs> Well, and the, but the idea is that God wants to take pleasure in us. And yeah. his disappointment is that the one bag man didn't, didn't, didn't do what he could have done with it. And you know what it was? Oh, going back to goodness, look at, look at verse 26, verse 24. Verse it says, 20... then the man who had received, yeah. Go verse ahead. 24, you ready? Yeah. So it says, then the man who had received one bag of gold came and said, Master, he said, I know that you are what? A hard man. Oh, Oh, when we think God is hard, can we trust him or do we bury our gold? Look what mm -hmm. it says. Then the man who had received one, <laughs> one bag of gold said, Master, he said, I knew that you're a hard man. You harvest where you did not sow and you gather where you had not scattered seed. So I was what? Afraid. Ooh. And I went out and I hid your gold in the ground. So here, here's what belongs to you. Now, it's interesting. Look what the master says. He says, you wicked and lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit. Now, you know what Jesus isn't doing? He's not saying that the man is admitting to being that. He's saying, you saw me this way and you still did what you did. <laughs> you knew. And this is how you behave. What? The fact of the matter is, is the first two men actually show what the master's character actually was because they respond lovingly, respectfully, honorably. They, they, they respond with the freedom that they knew they had because the master didn't tell them how to do it, when to do it, where to do it, but just to do it. See, the one bag man never trusted the master to begin with. And maybe that's why the master only gave him one bag to begin with. That's a, I never thought of that because I was wondering, why is the guy that squandered, you know, didn't do anything with it, got the shaft to begin with? But because it was, God, it, it's a two-way yeah, trust. I mean, trust is a two-way street, right? Yeah. The master knew what he had. The master knew it. But you know what's? But here's the grace of God. The master knew what he had, and you know what he did anyway? Gave him a bag of gold. Yeah. He still entrusted some of his wealth. See, as we as believers, as we grow in trust, as we grow to trust God more. We will take what he has given us and we will we will go out and and do it according to how we're made. What gives me pleasure and gives him pleasure. The more I trust God, the better the, the, the and I taste him and I see that he's truly good. He, you know, as he gives me according to my ability and my capacity and the freedom to function the way I'm designed to function, because he's the one who made me. I find great joy in putting that to work. I create, find great joy in the investment. I find great joy in the handing him back. Look what I've earned for you. See, the master's true character is actually shown by the response of the five bag man and two bag man. One bag man had, had, a, had a dirty lens. And so he treated the master the way he perceived the master. And he didn't trust the master because he didn't he did he could not he could not receive the good of the master. If we hop down, what is it, twenty nine? So he goes on, he says, Yep. Yeah. So he says, Take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and who and and they will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what they have, even what they have will be taken from them. And then he says, Now you, who obviously have completely misread my character, my nature, my goodness, my grace, my mercy, the opportunity that I give you, everything that I have offered you to succeed and given you, entrusted to you, I'm going to ask you to walk away, please. You know, and that's still grace. 
He didn't kill the man. He didn't have the man executed. He said, let's discipline the man. Let's put him out. I think that's a really powerful, I mean, I had never thought about some of those elements in that story, even though we went through that a few years back. Um, the the perception of the master towards who he was giving what he was giving was uh there you know the the master in this is wise and knows what these these servants think about him before he gives them what he gives them and i just that is a challenge to all of us you know i mean wow well you know you just said something i want to dan jones is saying something here he says the hard thing is when we see that we have been get what we have been given and we compare it to what others have been given thus thinking we are valued less but that is not true he is willing to give us what we can handle in the moment yeah. that is brilliant and it's just it's exactly what you just said god is so gracious as to only give us what our faith can handle right and that doesn't only mean trial and tribulation it also means expectation ability and capacity that's why it saddens me. Listen to me. I don't know how many people are still listening, but listen to me. Nothing gives me greater sadness than somebody who cannot receive and take joy in how God has made them. That God has taken pleasure in how they have been made. That they have been made in a good and pleasing way. And that God knows them so well and so intimately that he has crafted all of their, everything around them to... Um, to be able to do exactly what they were made to do. And in fact, we're being recreated in Christ Jesus to do it, to, to have it redeemed and do it in an eternal fashion. That's yeah. why it says in Ephesians, we've been created in Christ Jesus to do good works prepared in advance for us to do. Go ahead, Matt, I'm sorry. I, Laura Davis hit the nail on the head for where my heart is in all of this. She said, amen, I should not see it as a shameful thing for not trusting God in a certain area. I need to see it as an opportunity to trust him in a new area. He's, grow he's growing and multiplying my faith and trust. And I think that is the heart of God. Once you, are, once you are aware, God is not showing it to shame you. He's showing mm -hmm. it as an opportunity. And, he's, yep. and it, he is slow to anger, quick to love. He's gracious. He has a throne of mercy. He says, boldly come to it. So, Laura, I just love that comment. It is an opportunity. It's not a shame. It's not a shaming tactic. You know, you know it's fun. yeah, right. And you know, I want to go back to something Dan said too, and and that uh, you know, Paul said that we can. He said, take pride in you know, work according to how God has made you, you know, given and and the opportunities that are in front of you, and do it in such a way that you can take pride in your own behavior, pride in your own actions. It's the one place in Scripture where pride is actually lauded. Right. But then he goes on to say, and make sure that your pride is based on how what on your relationship with God and how you're functioning in it, not by comparing yourself to others. You know, one of the most one of the most deadly things we can do to our soul is compare ourselves to other people and wonder why. Like, either deadly. Did it. Yes. It will crush our souls in a heartbeat. It will kill creativity in a, in an instant. Yeah. And it, it it is oh gosh. Yeah. Because then we start imitating people we were never meant to imitate, doing things we were never meant to do, think things we were never think to, never, God never intended for us to think. If every, if we, all of us here, you and me, Tony, everybody here listening, we believe that God made us in his image and he said it was good. When we compare ourselves to others, It, it undoes so many things that God is trying to do in us. Mm -hmm. It really does. And it's saying, you know, it, and it, it is inadvertently saying to him, eh, you said it was good, but I, I don't think so. It's a, well, Andrea said something really good here. It says comparison is the thief of joy. Right. She hit it right on the button. Comparison is the thief of everything. Right. Our imitating somebody else when God may have designed us in a completely different way, first of all, is to tell God you did something wrong. How you have made me is not, you know, I, I you know, unwise, un, un you know, no. Right. The second thing then is um, we, we forfeit the joy of 
accomplishing what God has actually created me to accomplish. And here, the phrase, well done, good and faithful servant, by trying to do something somebody else is doing or try to do it, you know, or, or comparing myself to them and, and not finding the joy in what it is that he has made me to be. It took I, me a lot of years to learn to love me for who I am. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I, say, I guarantee that everybody within the sound of our little <laughs> Facebook thing has struggled at some point in their life with comparing themselves to others in some way, whether it's body image, whether it's skill, whether it's smarts, whether it's money, whether it's whatever. Listen, listen, whether it's how many likes did I get on my picture versus how many likes they got on their picture. Yeah. It's astounding to me what it is we will will hone in on, just focus on, and all of a sudden, you know, to consider my worth based on, on a comparison with somebody else. It makes you just want to give somebody sad. a hug. You just want to <laughs> hug does. somebody. It does. It does. Um, you know, we're about out of time, guys. Is there anything else? And I don't know. I mean, we hardly scratch the surface on this subject. And, I, and I'm sorry if we didn't do it justice or, you know, for whatever reason, maybe. Uh, oh, you stop know, we didn't apologizing. Get this, you know, it, you know, this is great. I, I um, <laughs> uh, is there anything else you guys, uh, is there a question we missed or a comment? Uh, I otherwise, a, I think, go ahead. I, I have a question from a viewer. He's popped in here. <laughs> sure. This is uh he wants to know uh, if anybody else is cuter than him. And he knows that everyone's comparing their dogs to him. And, uh, oh, that's oh. Chewy. <laughs> now the dog has a concussion. <laughs> the dog is dead. No, I'm just kidding. Right. Oh, no. That's from no. a movie. All right. So um, I think we're at closing prayer, yeah? Yeah. Wait, Dan said so. Focus. Oh, oh damn. We, and we are so focused on a sense of equality. Everything has mm. to be equal or it is unfair. Mm. But God knows what you need and what you can handle. Equal does not mean fair. Well, that's that. Yeah. I mean, if we In go. Fact, to, <laughs> yes. Oh, God. I mean, we could do an extended. Subject. We could do an extended oh. version tonight, but our wives might kill us. But <laughs> oh, my goodness. Daniel, that's such a good thing. Uh, and and uh, yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah, a, yeah, that's yeah, two yeah. more hours of. I cannot tell you the number of people who have walked into my office to tell me something wasn't fair. I'm like, oh, oh my goodness. Maybe we should do that next week. Should we talk about fairness next uh, well, maybe week? Maybe we need to go to fairness next week because I use your little thing all the time with my kids. Uh, and you, I, don't, I forget you had said something years ago, but if one says, what? Graham gets to have Kool-Aid and I get orange juice. That's not fair. And so I'll say, oh, everybody wants to be fair? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, well, and, and, and you know, usually now Nora's getting big enough where she's not doing super babified things. But I would say, okay, well, tomorrow everybody's getting up and everyone's wearing diapers because Nora's in diapers. <laughs> what? That's not fair. No, it's totally fair. I'm going to treat you guys all equal and fair. And everybody gets, uh, you know, high C or fruit punch or whatever you want, but you all have to wear diapers and you're all <laughs> going to dress the same. And I'm going to talk to you and say, go, 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 ga, ga. And, and they hated that. And I still try to do that as best I can because fair is totally different than. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, you know, we'll give you a taste of next week. How's this sound? I have four children. I love them all equally, but I love them all differently. Right. And the least fair thing I could have ever done was to like how I loved Rachel and then say to the other three, you're going to get Rachel's love. I don't care what kind of love you like, would like. I don't, it doesn't matter to me what kind of love you need. I like the way I love Rachel. You all get, is that fair? There's nothing more utterly unfair than that. God, and, and, and this is a great way to close this. That's exactly how God loves us. And he's God a God says, of... I... Sorry, go ahead. No, right. Finish. Go. He's a God of I, justice. He yeah. says he's a God of justice, not necessarily. I don't. I, I mean, I. I don't think I can think of. Well, he, he says I'm he a God says, of Proverbs, fairness. He says to know what's right and just and fair. Right. Yeah. Here's what's fair about God. What would be unfair is if he ch decided that the way he loves Anthony, me, is the way he's going to love everybody. 
it's a good love. I, I'll tell you, I enjoy it. But I enjoy it, and it's pleasurable to me because it's designed for me. It would be a What's disaster if he loved oh, me it? the way he loves you. An absolute disaster. And so what's fair is, here's what's so beautiful about God. And, and please take this home because this is the goodness of God. He knows you by name. He knows exactly the way you're designed. And he loves you as you need. So don't compare. <laughs> right. He's gonna, it's like when, when God said to Peter, you know, you're going to die this way. And Peter turned around and looked at John and said, well, what about him? And you know what Jesus said? That's none of your business. You follow me. What's that to you? He knows exactly what we need according to who we are, according to the way we're made. And he loves us perfectly as we are. And that's fair. That is fair. And it's good. Yeah. It's good. So uh, I think that's it for the night. Yeah. I think so. We're about that 810 mark. That's about where we usually wind up a little bit. Okay. All right. You want to close in prayer tonight? Sure. Yeah. Um, Jesus, we thank you and praise you. And, um, we just breathe in your grace during this, uh, season of life. And, uh, Lord, we just pray that that would then breathe out your praise and, and, and gratitude and thanks to you for who you are. Lord, give us eyes that see, uh, redemption and see you in the midst of uh, sometimes what we could easily criticize or we could compare or we could whatever. But, Lord, I just pray that, um, Lord, we would be at peace with how you've made us, that we would be at peace with how you've made others, that we would love you, that we would love ourselves, and we would love others as we love you and as we love ourselves, Lord, and that that love would be made complete um, as we love you and we love ourselves and love others, Lord. And, um, Lord, thank you that you're kind and you're gracious. Um, and I just pray, Lord, that this little time we had together tonight would be something that is encouraging, uh, edifying, uplifting, um, and pointing towards you. And I pray for everybody that was with us tonight, and I just pray that you would reveal more and more of your love and more and more of your freedom and peace and just joy into their hearts and lives this week. We miss everybody a lot, and um, I just thank you, God, and I pray that we would just be patient during this time and kind. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. I hope this was fruitful. Um, same. Well, I guess we'll see you this weekend. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. What? Yeah. Uh, fr there's a Friday night fun though. There'll be some going on there. We won't be a part of that because we're not fun. No, I'm. I am <laughs> the least fun human being in the history of the world. So that will but, be three, what, week, what, three what, weeks from now. The topic of the night will be how unfun Tony is. So next week right. is. Uh, what was it? Comparisons next week? What were we, what were we laying in on? No, fairness. Fairness. Oh, which is comparing. That's comparing. Get comparing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fairness next week and then unfun, unfunness of Tony. <laughs> you guys have a great <laughs> night. Thank you so much. All right. See you guys. Bye.